Hello, I hope that you're all well and enjoying the class thus far. Today, we are going to discuss personality preferences using the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator. Uh, while this uh, instrument has been criticized for not holding up well uh, for the purposes of research and validity, it does get the conversation going around communicating with various personality types. Uh, we'll also discuss uh, the uh, three elements of Aristotelian persuasion, that's ethos, pathos, and logos. As always, uh, I do use the Socratic method in, in my face-to-face -face class, so as I ask questions through the video, just pause, jot your answer down, um, and, uh, and then hit play afterwards. So uh, first question is, do you believe that good communication is just common sense? Um, and can communication be taught? I'll, I'll let you pause momentarily. So the answer is uh, communication is not necessarily just good common sense. And yes, it can absolutely be taught. Uh, communication, like leadership, can be taught. It, and while it's true, uh, as with any other skill set, that some people have a natural aptitude and awareness for communication or any other skill set, uh, communication does take a conscious effort. It's not something that simply happens. Uh, one of the things we uh, make a mistake uh, when we communicate with either someone in our uh, professional life or even our personal life is um, they understand what we mean or they understand our words um, or they should know what we mean. They should, uh, they should um, already understand what's going on in their head. This is simply not the case. So today we'll, we'll talk about communication and self-awareness. These are absolutely crucial um, when it comes to leadership uh, and uh, leading organizations. Um, our objectives, uh, we're going to discuss self-awareness, uh, personality types, communication preferences. Uh, we're gonna talk about the curse of knowledge and how that creates a barrier to effective communication. And we'll also describe again, ethos, pathos, and logos, the, the fundamental elements of persuasion. So first thing, if you would, uh, grab a piece of paper and uh, sign your name to it with your preferred hand. Um, so if you're right-handed, uh, sign your signature with your right hand. And obviously if you're left-handed, um, sign with your left hand. And then pause, pause the video while you do that. So next, what I would like you to do is sign your name with your non-preferred hand. So if you're right-handed, uh, sign your name with your left hand. And if you're left-handed, sign your name with your right hand. Now, when I do this in a class full of 30 or 40 students, everyone chuckles uh, because it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it, unless you're ambidextrous, it's difficult to sign your name with your non-preferred hand. However, you're not wrong you were able to do that. You, you were capable of signing your hand with your non-dominant, uh, sign your name with your non-dominant hand. It just felt odd. And the analogy I'm trying to convey here is that personality preferences are the same way. Um, some of us may lean, uh, have a natural a tendency towards extroversion, um, but that does not mean we're incapable of being introverted or uh, conducting tasks that would be more easily done by an introvert. So let's talk about extroversion and introversion. Uh, let's talk about extrovers, uh, extroverts first. So extroverts prefer getting their energy from active involvement in events, having lots of different activities. Uh, extroverts are uh, excited when they're around people. They're, they enjoy being energized. Uh, by other people. They enjoy energizing people. Uh, they prefer quick action and making things happen. Uh, they generally feel at home in the world. Um, extroverts often understand a problem better when they can talk out loud about it and hear what others have to say. Uh, while everyone else is scratching their head and uh, they're wondering, you know, what is the extrovert thinking here? I don't understand their, their decision-making process. Well, they might not either. They're in the process of figuring it out. They literally think out loud. Um, extroverts are seen as outgoing or as uh, people persons. They're comfortable in groups. They like working in groups. Uh, they generally possess a wide range of friends. Um, one of their, uh, again, I said earlier, there are people of action. Their weaknesses 
is they do before they think. Um, another is they tend to dominate conversations. Um, they uh, jump uh, too quickly into an activity and don't allow uh, enough time to think it over. Um, but nonetheless, they have strengths. Again, I'm generally an, ex uh, an extrovert. Uh, and by the way, I want to point out that everything is a spectrum. You are not um, just an extrovert or just an introvert. Um, when, when you guys, I have an assignment for you. When you take the MBTI, you'll see that there is some portion of you is extroverted and some smaller portion is introverted or vice versa. It just depends on what your dominant personality trait is. So don't think of these as absolutes. Um, so let's talk about introverts. Introverts prefer getting their energy uh, from dealing with ideas, uh, pictures, memories. Um, they often prefer doing things alone and they don't like to be distracted. Um, they take time to reflect uh, so they have a clear idea of what's going on. Um, sometimes they um, like the idea of something better than the actual than the actual real thing. Um, if you if you ever have a coworker, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of how introverts and extroverts behave differently. Um, you ever knock on someone's door at work and they're frustrated? You, your entry has irritated them. Um, they're probably lost in their work. They're probably introverted. They don't want to be bothered. Or as an extrovert, they'll stop whatever it is they're doing and pay attention to you. Um, neither approach is right or wrong. Uh, but if you notice uh, your coworkers and how they behave, you can modify your behavior to communicate better with them. Um, so let's go back to uh, introverts. So they're uh, certainly more comfortable being alone. Uh, they like things they can do by themselves. Uh, they don't, um, and again, this is an overgeneralization, but they don't necessarily have a, a broad swath of friends as an extrovert may. Um, some of their strengths, they, they absolutely work well alone. Um, distractions uh, can irritate them. Uh, some of their weaknesses is um, they spend too much time reflecting and they don't actually move into action quickly enough. We've heard this before. It's called analysis paralysis. Sometimes they'll forget to check with the outside world uh, to see if their ideas actually fit the experience. So what I would like you to do is think about these two uh, different types of personality preferences and uh, pause the video momentarily and think or write down how can those personality traits be misunderstood. And I'll, I'll provide uh, some answers when you come back. So generally extroverts, whether it's a weakness or it's a misperception, um, they tend to dominate conversations. Um, they don't, uh, the misperceptions, they don't think things through well enough. Um, and this, this is a misunderstanding. Um, uh, introverts are the same way. They can be misunderstood in that they're being rude. Um, they can be m misunderstood as shy. Um, or antisocial, it's not the case. It's just their preference. Um, so let's talk about the next uh, set is sensing versus intuition. This is how we take in information, okay? So sensing, high sensors, uh, pay attention to the physical world, the physical reality. What can they see, hear, touch, taste, and smell? Uh, they are concerned with the, what is actually present, uh, current, and real. They notice facts, remember details that are important to them. Uh, they like to see the practical use of things and learn best when they see how to use what it is they're learning. Uh, experience speaks to them louder than words. It's a tangible thing that they can trust. Um, high sensors are generally seen as remembering events as snapshots of what actually happened. Uh, they solve problems by working through facts until they understand the problem. Uh, they're generally considered pragmatic and look to the bottom line, uh, starting with facts, and uh, then they form a big picture. Uh, they trust experience first and trust words and symbols uh, less. Uh, their strengths are they are highly analytical. So a lot of high sensors will see them in fields like engineering or accounting or finance. I've also noticed in my work 
that uh, veterans, uh, uh, um, law enforcement, um, and uh, service veterans, ar the armed forces veterans, tend to be high sensors. Uh, some of their weaknesses, um, or sometimes they're unable to connect the dots. They see the facts, but they don't necessarily see the big picture. They pay so much attention, uh, either the present or the past, they miss uh, new possibilities, or, or as I said earlier, the bigger picture. So that's some of their weaknesses. Uh, intuition, or intuits, I guess you could call them, uh, they pay the most attention to impressions or the meaning and patterns of information. Uh, they would rather learn by thinking a problem through uh, than by hands-on experience. Uh, they're interested in new things and what might be possible. Uh, they tend to think more about the future than the past. Um, they like to work with symbols or abstract theories. Uh, they remember events more as impressions of what it was like rather than the actual facts uh, or the events that actually happened. Uh, high intuits are seen as remembering events by reading between the lines. Um, they solve problems by leaping between different ideas and possibilities. They're interested in doing things that are new and different. Um, they see the big picture, uh, or uh, seeing the big picture, um, then they go to seek out the facts. Um, they trust their impressions, um, and sometimes they think too much about new possibilities, and they never actually look at how to make them a reality. Uh, sometimes we see these folks as dreamers, um, or their, their heads in the clouds. Um, that, that would be a, a weakness. Uh, their strengths, however, um, is that they, they do see the big picture. They do connect the dots more readily than someone who's high sensing. Um, so a lot of, a lot of in, intuits or high intuition folks are entrepreneurs, CEOs, um, uh, folks that um, have to see a big picture and then they have a workforce beneath them to, to hammer out the details. Um, again, I want you to pause the video and think of how each personality type can be misunderstood. And I'll try to throw some ideas out at you when you come back. So high sensing folks, because they're factual and concrete, uh, they can appear to be un, you know, immovable right? um, or stiff, right? Um, uh, the high intuition folks, as I said earlier, they can be seen as you know, their heads in the clouds uh, they're not, their world is not couched in reality. Um, these, are, these are misunderstandings. And again, um, no one is purely high sensing or purely uh, intuitive. It's a, it's a spectrum. So next, let's talk about um, how do we make decisions? So thinkers uh, versus feelers. So thinkers, when they make a decision, they like to find the basic truth or principle to be applied regardless of the specific situation involved. Uh, they like to analyze the pros and cons and be consistent and logical, this is the key word here, logic, in deciding. Uh, they then, uh, they generally try to be impersonal and impartial as to not let their personal wishes or other people's personal wishes influence them. Um, thinkers are seen as enjoying the technical and scientific fields where logic and reason is important. Uh, they, they are quick to notice inconsistencies. Uh, they look for logical explanations or solutions to almost every problem, uh, making decisions with their mind, um, and they possess a desire to be, again, fair and logical. They believe that telling the truth is more important than being tactful. So some of these folks can be seen as rigid or uncaring. Uh, their strengths, again, they are uh, highly analytical, um, their weaknesses, um, sometimes they miss or don't see the value of the people part of the situation, which is what this class talks about most, is the, the, the workforce and, and how they behave. Uh, they can be seen as task-oriented, uncaring, and or indifferent. So uh, as opposed to high feelers, right, um, you can guess what this means. So feelers believe that they can make the best decisions by weighing what people care about and the points of view of the persons involved in the situation. 
they're concerned with values and what's best for the people involved. They like to do whatever will establish or maintain harmony. They appear caring, warm, and tactful. Uh, high failures are seen as having a people or communications orientation. Uh, they're primarily concerned with harmony and uh, nervous when it is missing. Uh, they uh, probably don't, uh, they're, they don't like conflict. Um, they look for what is important to others and express concern for others. They make decisions with the heart and possess a desire to be compassionate, uh, believing uh, that being tactful is more important than telling the cold truth. Um, their strength is that they do absolutely have their pulse on the people. Uh, their weakness is uh, sometimes they miss seeing or communicating the hard truth of a situation. And sometimes experienced by others is too idealistic, mushy, or indirect, right? Um, so again, I want you to pause the video and think of how uh, each personality type can be misunderstood. And uh, when you come back, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. So uh, again, with the thinkers, um, they can be seen as cold, um, too analytical, um, lacking emotion. Um, this is a, uh, a misunderstanding. It, actually, if you, if you talk to them, it's not that these folks simply don't care, because again, uh, you're not 100% thinking or 100% feeling. It's a spectrum. It's that this is how they make a decision. So uh, I'll give you an example. The first sort of big project I took on was um, I had to turn around a failing company, a company that was an electrical distribution and parts uh, company. They worked with uh, petrochemical plants and industrial plants here in Baton Rouge. They had been losing money for about five years. The only reason they hadn't gone under was um, they had deep pockets. And one of the things we had to do initially when we got there was let go of quite a few employees. Um, it wasn't fun, but it was absolutely necessary. Uh, we were, at the time, we were spending way too much money on salaries. So um, I wasn't heartless, uh, but I knew it had to be done. Um, and that's how I made my decision. If I had a higher propensity for feeling, I may have not made that hard decision um, and not let anybody go. Uh, it's, so again, I, I want to reiterate, it's not that you know, someone who's high thinking simply doesn't care. Uh, they do. It's just they see the world as logical. And this is the, the decision we have to make. And it's unfortunate, but this is what we have to do. So lastly, uh, we'll talk about uh, judging versus perceiving. And this is how you approach your life. So uh, judges, um, use their decision making or judging preference, uh, whether it is thinking or feeling in their outer life. Uh, to others, they seem um, to prefer a planned or orderly way of life. They like to have things settled and organized. They feel more comfortable when decisions are made and they like to bring life under control as much as possible. Uh, so. I don't want you to confuse the term judging with judgmental. Uh, judgmental typically is, has a negative sense uh, about, about it, and that's, that's not what we mean when we say judging. So, uh, I, 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 so I am high judging. I'll give you an example of how I behave, um, and you may laugh at me. Um, I like things to be neat and orderly, uh, whether that's my military background or just my personality preference. Um, uh, I might actually seem a bit OCD to some folks. Uh, for, so for example, my car, my car gets washed every single day. There's not a speck of trash in my car. Um, there will never be a speck of trash in my car. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, I make my bed every day. I, I make sure there are no dishes in the sink. I make sure that the, the living room is vacuumed and that the animals are fed. I, have, I definitely have a routine. Um, that's what we mean when we say judging. Not that I look at someone and say, oh, they're, they're uh, you know, whatever it is, they're dumb or they're a terrible person. There's a, a distinct difference, and I want, you to realize, I want you to understand that. So uh, judges are seen as uh, they prefer to have things decided. So here's another example. When I'm in meetings, 
I will at the end of that meeting, I will typically say something around, okay, so this is what we discussed, and this is uh, this is who is doing what, right? You're responsible for this, you're responsible for that, I'm responsible for this, and when we meet in a month, you know, we'll we'll uh, circle back around and you know talk about whatever it is we did in the interim. Um, that's my preference to having things decided. I don't like things to be nebulous. I don't. I, uh, to me, it's inefficient. Um, they appear to be uh, task oriented. Again, that my example earlier of how I keep my house and my car and uh, take care of my pets. I'm I'm absolutely very task oriented. Um, they prefer to make lists. Judges uh, prefer to make lists of things to do. I absolutely do that. Um, they do prefer to get work done before playing. Um, play. I, I'm absolutely guilty of this. I will stay at work till nine o'clock at night because I don't want to bring my work home. Uh, when I'm home, that's time to play and relax. But when I'm at work, I'm at work. Um, they prefer, um, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, their strengths are, they're certainly task master, masters. Uh, they keep everyone on the team on point. Uh, their weakness is sometimes they focus so much on the goal that they miss new information. They're so task oriented, uh, they don't see, I think the term is they don't see the forest through the trees. Uh, so these, these are judging folks, not to be confused with being judgmental, there's a difference. Uh, next is uh, perceivers and um, they approach life, they use their uh, function, whether it's sensing or intuition in their outer life. Uh, they see others, excuse me, uh, to others, uh, they seem to prefer a flexible and spontaneous way of life. Uh, they prefer to understand and adapt uh, to the world rather than organize it. Uh, others see them as staying open to new experiences and information. So think of folks when, uh, and again, I want to stress this, that you are not 100% judging or 100% perceiving. When I go on vacation, I could care less about the order of things. I just go and have a good time. My father-in-law, he is an engineer, and before, the, uh, before we go on vacation, he has an Excel spreadsheet of dates, times, locations, GPS coordinates of ever, everywhere the family is going. Uh, I am not that judging. He takes uh, judging to a whole new level, right? I, I just wanna go and have fun. Uh, he wants the entire uh, experience to be organized from day one. Uh, perceivers, when we think of them going on vacation, I probably am more uh, of a perceiver, right? Uh, I just want to go and whatever happens, happens. That's my, my play life. Um, so, <clears throat> and again, uh, perceiving does not mean being perceptive um, in the sense of having a quick and accurate perceptions of people around the world or uh, people in your world. That's not what we mean when we say perceiving. So high perceivers are seen as preferring to stay open, to respond to whatever happens. They're, they're pretty flexible. This can be a, a strength. Uh, they appear to be loose and casual. Uh, they prefer to keep plans at a minimum. Uh, they prefer to approach work as a play or a mix of work and play. Uh, I don't. Uh, like I said earlier, I'll stay to work till 9, 10 o'clock at night. When I go home, that's when I play. Uh, I, I try not to mix the two. Um, they generally work in bursts of energy, um, and they are stimulated by an approaching deadline. These are the folks you hear them, <coughs> they say, I work well under pressure. This is, this is this group. So their strength is they are incredibly flexible. This is, this is valuable. Uh, if you are so uh, immovable and so rigid, um, and you, you are so task-oriented, and you're not even really thinking of the reason of why you're completing a task, this can hurt you. Um, so in, in this sense, perceivers, that being that they're flexible and they can spin on a dime, this is very important. This is useful in business. Uh, their weaknesses is, uh, or uh, sometimes they uh, say they're open to new information so long as um, they miss making the decisions uh, when they're needed. Um, so again, uh, as we did with the others, I want you to uh, consider how each personality type can be misunderstood. I'll pause, you can pause the video, write some things down, think of some friends and work colleagues and, and how they sort of fit into some of these personality types and think of how they are misunderstood. Pause the video and then come back to me.
So, um, perceivers, right? We can, uh, the misinterpretation or the misunderstanding is maybe they're disorganized. Uh, they're not committed. They're not disciplined, right? Because they are so flexible and kind of go with, uh, go with the wind. Um, that's a misperception. The strength is because they are flexible is they can make a move quicker uh, than saying, say someone who is high judging. Uh, the misperception of someone who is high judging is uh, that they're inflexible, immovable, um, and um, uh, this, can, this can hurt, especially if you're trying to uh, change the direction of an organization. Um, however, there's, a, there's obviously a natural strength to it as well, is we need folks that are disciplined and task-oriented uh, to make sure the, the mission gets accomplished. So next, we are going to discuss uh, Aristotelian persuasion, uh, ethos, pathos, and logos. So I, got, I have a couple questions here. Um, and this is Mike the Tiger. Um, so uh, if communicated enough times, uh, your communications are effective. Is that a myth? Is that true or false? And uh, please, again, pause between each of these questions and, and kind of jot down your own thoughts. Uh, the next question I have is, uh, if you have a strong enough case, everyone will be convinced. And again, pause. Uh, no, I, I want to focus on that one. Uh, um, why is it that if you have a strong enough case, you're not going to convince everybody? Or people, I'm going to ask you this question. Are people more logical or are they more emotional? How do they make decisions? Is it based off the greater good or is it based off of some personal incentive? And consider that when you think of that question. Um, the, the answer to that is uh, generally uh, folks make decisions by emotion. They are more concerned with uh, what happens to them rather than the greater picture. So you can have a strong enough case which um, is you know, great for the organization. Your approach can be great for the organization, but it may hurt a couple of people along the way, but it's good for the entire company. Um, those folks are gonna fight you uh, if they're more concerned with themselves rather than the company. Uh, the next myth, uh, these are myths by the way, uh, that listening is a passive activity. Listening is not a passive activity. It is absolutely an active activity. Um, when I'm in a conversation with a student, uh, I will uh, turn my computer off, I turn my cell phone upside down so it doesn't beep or disturb me. Um, I repeat back to them uh, what they've asked me to make sure I completely understand uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever their problem is. Uh, listening is not a passive activity, it's an absolutely active activity. You engage uh, with the person you are communicating with. This is a myth that listening is a, pack, uh, a passive activity. Another myth is words mean what they mean. Anyone in a romantic relationship, or in the beginning of a romantic relationship, knows right away that words uh, do not mean what they mean. Um, that our backgrounds and our experiences um, uh, in our lives can create nuance around words. So when we're communicating, we absolutely have to make sure uh, that both parties understand perfectly what it is we're talking about. Um, next is um, being assertive means being a jerk. Um, that's, an, that's another myth. Not necessarily. Uh, I can be assertive and still be polite, right? Uh, I don't have to be a jerk to get what I want done, done. I just have to be assertive and firm. Uh, so, but there is a difference between being uh, a jerk and, uh, and being assertive. So uh, communication affects almost every aspect of managerial behavior. Uh, communication is fundamental to leadership. One thread amongst all great leaders is they are great communicators. Um, as managers and leaders and executives, we must adapt our style of communication to our audience, to our coworkers, our peers, um, the, the folks that work for us. Um, this often folks confuse this with uh, not sticking to our standards. They're two different things. 
I can absolutely hold someone to a standard, uh, a firm standard. It can be a tough standard without being a jerk about it, without raising my voice, uh, without being condescending or sarcastic or belittling. Um, so don't think that you have to be a jerk to make sure someone sticks to a standard. Um, and understand that not everyone knows what you know. We're actually going to talk about that in the next slide. Not everyone knows what you know or thinks the same way that you think. We just talked for about 15 minutes on the various personality uh, types uh, uh, for the Myers-Briggs, extrovert versus introvert, thinking, judging, feeling, uh, perceiving, um, high sensors, etc. Uh, we just talked about how not everyone thinks the way that you think. We have to consider this when we are uh, communicating with our employees. So let's talk about the curse of knowledge. So the curse of knowledge is the tendency for an informed, knowledgeable person to not be able to communicate that knowledge that's in their head to others. I'll give you an example. Um, quite a few of you folks are engineers. Um, um, I read your bios. So think if you had to explain your job to a fifth grader, how much context would be missing? Um, you are subject to the curse of knowledge. Um, you were so far beyond them, uh, and I'm not insulting the fifth grader here or anybody you end up communicating with, but uh, you have so much knowledge in your head, you forgot what it was like to not understand what you currently understand. Um, experts often forget what it's like to be a beginner, um, and experts often assume beginners know more than they know. Uh, you've had this knowledge in your head for so long it is almost common sense um, to act in a certain way or make certain decisions. You have to understand that not everyone um, thinks the way you think, and you may have to take the time out to explain something to, uh, to a, a coworker, a peer, or an employee. It's not that they're dumb, it's just they don't have the experience and the knowledge that you have. So <clears throat> how do we overcome the curse? Of, of knowledge. Well, the first thing we do is we have to analyze and know our audience, right? So who am I speaking with? How old are they? What is their professional expertise? Uh, what is their professional experience? Going back to the personality types, are they extrovert or they're introverted? Are they high sensing? Are they high feelers, high thinkers, high judgers? Um, we modify how we communicate to our audience. Um, transform your message to include the fundamentals of um, persuasion, or we'll talk about Aristotle here in a second. Um, again, I, I cannot reiterate this enough. We don't sacrifice standards. Uh, our employees uh, that we bring into our firms have to meet the standards that we set, but we do have to modify our communication and our behavior to get those employees to meet that standard. Uh, when I was an undergrad at Ohio State, I worked for FedEx, and actually, I learned this. I, you would think I would have learned it in the military. I didn't. I learned it in the civilian, the, the private sector. I was a they called us personnel coordinator, um, and uh, actually, one of you guys lives in Columbus. It was the the Grove City Hub. Um, it's about twenty minutes from Columbus, and uh, I was a, uh, a a personnel coordinator. I had a team of about twenty five or so employees, and uh, their role was to load. And then load trucks, or, or well, it depends on the shift, but um, in, in this scenario, we were unloading trucks. So, unloading trailers. Um, some employees, if you uh, were forceful and you threatened them, that's all it took. And they got the job done. Uh, you, you, the carrot and stick approach, right? Um, you, you'd, um, you were harsh on them, you were you know, maybe a mean to them, and it worked. And it, you were able to get productivity out of them. <clears throat> Other employees, if you use that exact same tactic, they would crumble and maybe even quit, or they would perform even worse than what they were performing before. Um, those folks, I discovered uh, later on, would, if you encouraged them, pat them on the back, gave them a, gave them a hand, whatever it was, right? You were, uh, you were holding them to a standard, but you were communicating softly to them. They picked up, they picked up the pace, and it worked. Uh, and then the last, uh, the last thing I figured out was, um, some folks neither neither would work, and they e either I'd have to fire them or uh, come up with some other method to get productivity out of them. 
Um, and the last thing I did was I, I'd empower them, uh, give them some a little bit of authority where they felt like they were special and their productivity um, uh, increased. So in, in neither of those uh, t instances where I was communicating with a different employee did I sacrifice a standard. If they didn't meet the standard, they didn't meet the standard and they could either get written up or terminated. Um, but the way I got those employees to meet that standard was absolutely uh, different. Um, so let's talk about Aristotle. So how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to communicate? How am I supposed to get my uh, audience to do what I want them to do? Uh, so people are persuaded by issues that directly impact them. Um, uh, this, this is how, we, this is part of developing your argument for, for your audience or your listeners, your employees, your, your clients, who, whoever they may be. Um, there are, so remember that, what's in it for them, all right? That's, that's a phrase um, we hear sales folks use quite a bit, all right? What's in it for the client or what's in it for your customer? What's in it for your coworker or your employee? What's in it for them? What's going to incentivize them to do what you want them to do other than you pounding your fist on the table saying, do this or you're out. Um, another thing to consider is personality types, okay? The way I communicate with someone who is primarily extroverted is not the way I'm going to communicate with someone who's primarily introverted. Again, I, I've said this a hundred times, you, we don't sacrifice the standard. The standard has to be met, but the way we communicate with that person is different. So we have to consider their personality types. Um, we have to project credibility, uh, convey emotion, and use logic. So these are the three that we're about to talk about, ethos, pathos, and logos. Um, it's best to use all three uh, and, and I'm using the term argument, um, but, but really we could we could superimpose the word communication um, instead of argument. It's when you're communicating to someone. We would use, we establish our credibility, we convey some emotion um, uh, to sort of tug at the heartstrings of whatever it is we're trying to get these folks to do, and we use logic uh, to back up our, our argument. Um, so we study our audience, we ask them questions, and we listen. We actively listen, all right? This is huge, all right? Again, we're not assuming they know something. If they don't know something, we're not assuming they're idiots, all right? Um, we just, we, we survey them. We ask them questions. We try to understand what gets them out of bed every morning, right? What motivates them, okay? Uh, do your research on their backgrounds and their interests. The, this is ammunition when you're communicating with someone or you're, or you're trying to get them to do what you want them to do, right? You have to know them, okay? So let's talk about ethos, uh, pathos, and logos. Um, so these are the three modes of persuasion um, referred to as ethical strategies or rhetorical appeals. Uh, there are devices and rhetoric um, that classify the speaker's appeal to the audience. So first, we're going to talk about uh, ethos. So uh, when working with clients, I often, so I'm, uh, in addition to uh, being a professor at LSU, I think I've told you guys already, I'm a consultant as well. And more often than not, uh, my PhD actually works against me. Um, most folks, and this, I doubt this would happen, it certainly didn't happen in New York. Um, I don't think it would happen in Houston, but in Baton Rouge, it's, it's a little different here. If I tell someone I'm a PhD, they immediately assume I'm an egghead, I'm all theory, uh, ivory tower, I don't have any real world experience. Um, so in order to convey my credibility, I, uh, I mean, it's obviously, it's on my resume, it's on my LinkedIn bio, they're gonna know that I'm a professor, they're gonna know that I have a, a PhD, but I, I talk more about uh, the work that I've done uh, as a turnaround executive or as a consultant, uh, the variety of jobs that I've worked with, I have letters of recommendations from previous clients. This is how I establish my credibility, not simply saying I'm a doctor. That does absolutely nothing uh, for, for my clients. Most of my clients are uh, predominantly blue collar. Uh, they work in plants or manufacturing. They don't care that I have a doctorate. Uh, it means nothing to them. Um, so ethos, credibility. Uh, ethos is the personal credibility of the speaker. Um, an emphasis should be uh, made on, uh, or, or should be made with similarities with your audience. Um, in my executive coaching, I've 
the company I work I work with a, uh, another company called Success Labs, and they often shoot over my way uh, veterans uh, because I'm a veteran, and that's something I have um, in um, uh, that I share I share with them. Um, as if if um, one of our other consultants tried to work with a uh, a former gunnery sergeant, or I've had a I've had a brigade commander, I've had a number two on a surface warfare ship and a number two guy on a, on a sub. Um, some HR consultant talking to them, it's not really going to get through to them. Um, but because that veteran and I have shared experience, uh, it, it helps bring credibility. Right? Um, and lastly, we are uh, trying to establish, through our credibility, we're trying to establish our authority and or expertise on a uh, specific topic. Uh, and I talked about this earlier, um, that I, I don't tout the PhD as much as I tout uh, my resume and the, the experiences that I've had outside of, of academia. So <clears throat> uh, the, the question is, I want you to imagine that you're supposed to conduct a training workshop on communication for high school students. Uh, this is a question. How would you go about enhancing your ethos, right? Um, and, I'm sorry, this uh, presentation is meant for essentially fifth year MBA students or they're coming right out of undergrad. But um, think if you were, um, maybe for you guys, because you're a little bit older, think if you had to do a, a workshop and you were communicating with under, you know, undergraduates, how would you establish your credibility? Well, you would probably tell them that you have an undergrad degree, right? That you've gone through uh, what they've gone through, right? You had to figure out how to apply for student loans or or uh, figure out how to navigate multiple jobs to pay for your tuition, right? This is, this is your credibility. You've been there before, right? Um, one does not simply expect to be trusted, right? Now, you in, in your own mind, again, this goes back to the curse of knowledge, uh, you don't even realize how much you actually know, right? Um, you just assume that you have all this experience and that that should without conveying that to your listener or your audience that that you're 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 fine you forget that people can't read your mind okay so you cannot simply expect to be trusted you have to prove yourself somehow some way all right so the next um uh, the next uh, element of aristotelian persuasions is pathos um so people are often swayed by emotion in fact um, now I can't speak for the rest of the world, uh, but certainly in the United States, uh, we are absolutely more uh, persuaded by emotion than logic and reason. If you simply focus on logic and reason and facts and ignore the emotional appeal to your audience, you'll likely lose them. Uh, they, they, on some level, they just they won't trust you. Um, <clears throat> so pathos is the use of emotional appeals and a message um, generally, the, the speaker will use stories and examples that are highly relevant to the listener. Uh, words and imagery uh, can trigger uh, emotional responses. <coughs> Excuse me. And one guy that's uh, famous for this is Donald Trump. Um, uh, and not I'm not trying to be political here, but one of the things that he does do well when speaking to his audience is he absolutely draws emotion out of them. All right, uh, yeah, phrases like build the wall or, um, you know, we're going to bring jobs back to coal country. These are emotional appeals uh, to his base. Um, and, uh, you know, some folks are irritated by him, but the folks that follow him, um, he, they feel like he gets them, right? They feel like he gets um, what their struggle is, okay? Um, so never forget the emotional appeal uh, when you're speaking to a coworker or an audience or you know a handful of employees. Uh, this has to be part of it. All right, it's uh, I hate to say it, but it's almost it's almost more important. Um, the, each of these ethos, logos, and pathos are all equally important. But in our day and age, people tend to pay attention to the emotional side of things before they pay attention to anything else. We have to be cognizant of this. We have to remember this, okay? Um, so lastly is uh, logos. Um, so if you are not logical, um, you your audience uh, can punch holes in your argument. 
Uh, so going back to, um, um, I guess, I'll, again, I'll use Trump as an example. It's almost risky to use him as an example, but um, he's been accused multiple times of um, n not having, you know, not thinking logically. Uh, one example um, was just recently he had said that he was going to, going to uh, for, uh, put forward a bill, or rather Congress was going to fo put forward a bill for a 10% tax cut for the middle class. Um, and immediately, uh, or, you know, a fact checker said, well, hey, President Trump, the Congress is not in session right now. How can that be done? So for, for folks that already don't like him, um, they, they're punching holes in his argument because his argument or his statement wasn't logical. So again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be too political. I just think that he's a, he's a good example of drawing emotion out of his, out of his supporters. Um, and I may be dating myself here, but um, if anyone grew up in the 80s or even before that, uh, this is a, a character from a sci-fi science fiction series. Um, this guy was a, a science officer in the military and uh, really logical, and that's how, and, and, and very unemotional, and, and that's how he made his decisions was purely through through logic. So, uh, which element, uh, we kind of talked about this earlier, but which element of persuasion is the most important, or, or um, not most important, but the most evident in our society? And I've sort of alluded to this earlier, right? And so I'll, I'll let you pause the video for a second and ask that question of yourself. In our society today, of the three, ethos, pathos, and logos, what is the most prevalent in our society? Okay, so uh, I presume you wrote it down. Um, and generally the answer is, is pathos, it's emotion. Uh, we are huge, we are very much uh, swayed um, by emotions. Um, especially right now in the culture we live in, it's rage culture. Everyone is very quick to be upset or be offended, or um, this is all a derivative of emotion, right? Um, so Mike Tiger says, you know, so does this mean that pathos is the best and most important element? No, it is not. Um, when you are communicating, and, and, and actually I, I ask you guys in subsequent assignments, even after this week, to incorporate this in, in some of your papers. Um, it depends on the personality type of your audience. So knowing your audience and knowing which approach uh, best appeals to them is helpful. However, uh, because all three elements uh, make a message more persuasive, it is wise uh, to include all of them. Don't just stick to one of them. Um, if you just stick to one, you're going to lose somebody. And if you stick to all three, um, you have a higher chance at, at getting someone's attention. Uh, so the next thing here is sorry back up um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna show this video uh, in the class you, you feel free to watch it or not I do have another one um, uh, with uh, it's mr. Rogers <clears throat> uh, that is a good example of utilizing all three uh, persuasion techniques ethos pathos and logos um, so but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this one so John Oliver um, and I'll, I'll tell you where is where he might be weak, but he, he in in his delivery. But he, he generally uses all three uh, of these techniques. So he uses pathos. Um, th this is a he does a um, an article or a, a piece on food waste, right? So he he opens up the video by showing a clip of a starving family. This is pathos. This draws emotion out of the viewer. Um, and <clears throat> ties it with logos by showing a statistic, right, logic, of 730 football stadiums worth of wasted, uh, tr uh, wasted food. Uh, so he, just in the first few seconds of the video, is appealing to both our pathos, our emotion, and our logos, our logic, by showing perfectly edible food in the landfill. Um, he goes, he shows ethos, again, by establishing himself um, as uh, someone who mocks uh, current issues, um, uh, immediately making jokes, um, sorry, immediately making jokes, making jokes out of it. So he's, he's trying to convey his credibility like, hey, isn't this ridiculous? Uh, can't we all agree that this is silly? Um, he again shows ethos 
um, by making more bad jokes uh, based off the research he did in order to produce the episode. Uh, this also shows credibility, right? Um, he reaches to his audience on a personal level by showing these, uh, these news, news stories and statistics to provoke an emotion uh, and make an appeal to see how absurd these, these issues are. Um, <clears throat> an example of this is uh, um, his stance on food waste. Again, he starts off with the stadiums and, and the statistics. Then he shows uh, um, one, that one-fourth of grocery bags get thrown away. That, that's another statistic he brings up. Um, he, he, he brings it home uh, by showing a working poor family that has trouble uh, getting enough to eat um, and, exposing, and exposes how meaningless um, sell-by dates are and how they're responsible for a good portion of all the wasted food. But my one criticism of, of him is uh, half the country probably won't ever watch this. They won't care because they're going to see him as um, very much liberal-leaning and partisan um, and that impacts his credibility, all right? So if someone, um, you know, I, I, I would guess there's probably not a uh, conservative Republicans watching this guy's show. Um, that hurts his credibility r right away. So he's, he's not gonna catch his entire audience. And the reason we use ethos, pathos, and logos is to cast a broad net to get as many people to listen to us as possible. So that, that would be my criticism of, of, of him here. Um, I do have a, another, uh, I said it earlier, Mr. Rogers. It's actually part of your, your reading material this week. Um, and there's a, a YouTube video that spells out, um, um, every, you know, everything he does, uh, or, or he, he spells out each element of ethos, pathos, logos, in a, uh, I think it was a congressional hearing he did back in the late 70s, early 80s. But that's up there. That's a really good example. So you, you guys have two examples of two um orators, I guess we call them, um, that are using these persuasive uh, techniques. So I want to leave you with this, um, because communication and self-awareness, which is essentially what we talked about today, self-awareness through understanding our own personality types and how they differ from others, and communication through ethos, pathos, logos, casting that, that net um, um, uh, to communicate with your audience or your employees. Um, I want to leave you with this pearl of wisdom. So the real power of uh, leadership comes from self-knowledge. This goes back to the MBTI. Um, those leaders who have the ability to access their preferences as well as their non-preferences and work hard to essentially have it all are the most successful. Uh, we have to be self-aware. We have to know what we are weak at. Um, in a, in a, in a for-profit seeking organization, most of the time what you do is if you are weak in a certain aspect of your personality, generally you try to hire somebody to pick up the slack. Um, but you would never know to do that if you weren't self-aware. And you may have a, a systemic problem in your organization that you're causing, but you're not self-aware enough to even know you're causing it. All right? uh, these leaders may have the ability to be verbal and gregarious, um, uh, gregarious is outgoing and friendly, uh, yet reflective uh, and peaceful and thoughtful. Uh, they can see the big picture, but they can pay attention to the, uh, the minor details. Um, uh, they're fair, they're objective, um, which would be, you know, objective being high sensing or, or high thinking or high judging, but they're compassionate, which is a, a trait of high feelers, right? They reframe, uh, I'm sorry, they remain focused on results, but they pay attention to the changing information uh, that needs to be addressed as it comes in. They're flexible, right? And this was, um, um, shoot, I, I, I already uh, forgot. It was uh, perceiving, sorry. Um, uh, be, being able to be flexible is a, a trait of uh, perceivers. So uh, effective leaders must possess enough self-knowledge to know when they must adjust their leadership style and behaviors for the good of the organization. Um, we'll, we'll get into this later, but if, there, if there's one thing I can leave you guys with is when we make decisions, we make decisions with the best interest of the organization in mind, not the best interest of our egos. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that later on in, in the semester. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about um, the homework for a minute. So for this week, you have two assignments. Uh, the first is ethos, uh, the ethos, 
pathos and logos presentation. So I want you to use all three elements of uh, Aristotelian persuasion and craft an argument. Um, I want you to pay attention. So depending on your, your natural preference, if you're an engineer, uh, your, your presentation is going to be heavy into logic. If you're a salesperson, um, you're going to be heavy into the emotion of the argument. I want you to use all three, all right? So credibility, emotion, and logic. Uh, pay attention. It, it's, uh, I want you to use all three. That's, that's, that's going to, if you don't, it's going to show up in your feedback that you, you leaned into one or the other. Um, you can do it on any topic uh, that you choose. It can be um, you know, the most serious or, or the most lighthearted. Uh, I'm okay with, with either approach uh, so long as you use um, these three elements of Aristotelian uh, persuasion. So the next uh, assignment is um, your MBTI um, uh, personality trait uh, uh, instrument. So go under course material. Before you do this assignment, go under course material and here's the instructions to take the assessment. So click on this, open this up. Um, this is the link and I have images of, of all the um, things I need you to do. Make sure you save your, your URL. This will be at the very bottom when you're done with the assessment. And when you go to actually post your uh, assignment here, um, make sure you put a link um, at the bottom of your of your response. So, um, what you're going to do here is you know write write a one and a half page double space reflection of your results. Answer these questions um, in your in your um, response, and make sure you you post the link to it so I can see that you actually did the did the assessment. Um, and then what I would like you to do is reply reply to one of your classmates. The reply is pretty short. I think uh, half a page. Um, let me see, replies to, I'm sorry. Yeah, one full paragraph. So it's about five sentences. And I'm looking to see is, do you guys have similarities? Do you have differences? Um, was there any revelation or, or something you learned out of this experience when you replied to, to one of your classmates? Um, that's it. If you have any questions, as always, uh, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, I'm gonna be grading, I've graded quite a few of your assignments uh, your intros, uh, and I will uh, spend the week um, grading uh, your your the other assignment you had for for the first week. So uh, again, if you need anything, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to help, and I hope you guys have a good week.